In John chapter 8, starting with verses 1 to 11, we might make it a little further than that today. We'll see. Uh, but let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Holy Father, thank you for this day that you've given us. Thank you for this time that we can come together and look at your word. And looking forward to later, Pastor, bringing the message during the morning service and then fellowship dinner after that. And bless those. I uh, pray also for those down the hall working with the younger kids and with the teens um, that this time will be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. So we'll be in John chapter 8, verses 1 to 11 to start out with today. And before we get into that passage, this is a passage that in some translations of the Bible will either be kind of footnoted off to the side or marked off with a note that says this section, actually starting with chapter 7, verse 53 to verse 11, is not in the oldest Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. And so there's some contention among some as far as whether this really belongs in the Bible, whether this is really part, should be part of the inspired canon of the Word of God. And I don't want to delve into that particularly deeply. I'll leave that for the academics and such. But do want to comment a little bit on it because it is a factor to take into account when looking at this passage. Uh, there are some who, who think that this was a true account but that it was not to be part of the inspired canon of the Bible. That it was a true account, but not originally part of the Gospel of John, not written by John. Um, others think it maybe was supposed to be part of Luke, or possibly some uh, translations will put it as kind of this standalone passage as an appendix to the Gospel of John, not knowing exactly where to put it. Uh, some put it kind of in, in chapter 7, a little bit earlier than it shows up in most translations. Up to about the 5th century, none of the manuscripts that we have show this passage. The, some of the earliest manuscripts in the 2nd century are just fragments. Uh, some of the earliest manuscripts of the New Testament are some fragments from the Gospel of John that likely were transcribed and written within 100 years of the Gospel of John being written. But those don't include this, but they also don't include much of the Gospel of John because they're just fragments of papyrus um, that were actually found in Egypt. So kind of aside to that, it's kind of interesting that within a hundred years of the Gospel of John being written, it was being copied and shared enough that it had made it to Egypt. And shows how much the word was distributed and how quickly it was distributed. By the eighth century or so, it's pretty much common that it was in the Gospel of John. And there are some who say, well, this was an addition by other scribes. There are others who think that it was part of the original Gospel of John and that it was deleted and then put back where it was supposed to be between the 5th and 8th century. And their thought on that is because this deals with a woman who's caught in adultery and Jesus forgiving her, that was found offensive to many of the early Christian leaders because they saw adultery as a sin that was so severe, they found it offensive that Jesus would pardon somebody and forgive somebody who was caught in that. And so because of this, there's some who think that was removed and then put back in where it was supposed to be, basically. Joe. We'll talk about that when we get to the details of the passage. Uh, the, the short answer is we don't 100% know because it isn't directly mentioned. Um, but that it's possible that this was part of the original manuscript of the Gospel of John, was removed because it was found as being offensive. At that time, even in, in Jewish culture, the three biggest sins, so to speak, would have been considered murder, idolatry, and adultery. And that carried over into the early Christian church. 
And some see this as some of the church fathers going, well, no, we can't have this because that might excuse adultery somehow. The passage doesn't do that. And in fact, if, if that's really what happened, that's quite sad because it meant that there was some within the Christian faith at that time that didn't understand that there was no sin so great that Jesus wouldn't forgive it. There was no sin that couldn't be forgiven. And to me, that's kind of an important tenet of Christianity because without that tenet, two of us have hope. Because if that sin can't be forgiven, where's the line drawn? The line drawn because to God, sin is sin. You know, James points out if we keep the law in its entirety but offend it at one point, we're guilty of it all. And if one of it is unpardonable, then we're kind of in trouble. But there is also, along with that, historically, this passage has been in the Bible for well over 1,300 years. And in some cases, it has a footnote. In some cases, it's relegated to a footnote. But historically, it has been a passage that's been accepted for well over 1,300 years. Uh, so I, I tend to agree with with those who think that, yes, it is part of the inspired word of God. Yes, it is where it's supposed to be. And kind of like what um, Edward Clink in his commentary on John said about this, he said, mere humans wrote words that are the very word of God. This requires some analysis and explanation from the academic, but it also requires reflection from the believer. The goal would not be absolute certainty, but appropriate faith in a trustworthy object we know today as the Bible. And so he points out that ultimately it takes faith to believe any or all of the Bible. And so the academics can discuss and say, well, based on this, we don't think this or don't think this, but ultimately it comes down to faith. I included on the handout a reference to uh, one of the, the articles that I looked at of a man named E.F. Hills um, in defense of this being where it should be that I thought was a good starting point for somebody who's interested in looking at that further as far as this passage. But let's actually get into the passage. So last week we were in chapter 7, and chapter 7 ends with the Jewish officials convening and wanting to arrest and kill Jesus. And in this, Nicodemus speaks up in verse seven, uh, chapter 7, verse 51, and brings up, does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? And at this the Jewish leadership kind of rebukes Nicodemus, mocks him as if he's from Galilee and has no standing and that he is all wrong thinking this. But yet, verse 53 says at that point, everyone went to his own house. So at that point, they disband and they don't resend the temple police to try to arrest and kill Jesus. So even though they're not convinced, their silence and their actions are put to an end. And it says, and everyone went to his own house, which then brings us to our passage today in chapter 8. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. And based on passages in Luke, often Jesus would stay in the Mount of Olives area, Bethany, um, which is where Mary and Martha and Lazarus lived was very close to the Mount of Olives and he would often stay there. So he goes to the Mount of Olives, it's likely where he kind of stayed when he was in the Jerusalem area. So everybody goes home, including Jesus, to sort of his temporary home in the Mount of Olives. Um, kind of notable with that is the Mount of Olives is um, just to the east of the temple and it would have been where the sheep 
that were pastured for temple sacrifices were kept in the Mount of Olives. So there's kind of a picture there of his home base in Jerusalem is where the lambs were kept that were the sacrifice. So picking up in, uh, well, adding on to that is first, verse 51. The Jewish rulers have been challenged by Nicodemus. Who is one of them? He's part of the Sanhedrin. He's part of that ruling group. But he's challenged him. Does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? And I think this is one of the potential clues that this passage does belong here because this is a passage about the Jewish rulers testing Jesus to try to catch him up and find evidence. It looks like they were silenced, but they took to what Nicodemus said to heart, and their resulting actions were, let's try to catch him on breaking the law of Moses. Because this, interesting, even though there are a number of challenges throughout the Gospel of John and throughout the other Gospels of the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees and the Jewish rulership challenging Jesus, this is pretty much the only one where they challenge him on a point of law within the law of Moses. The others are challenges on rabbinic and Pharisaic law, not so much the Mosaic law. And this comes right after Nicodemus has challenged him, does our law judge a man before it hears him? And then the next section is them trying to do exactly that. It's also why even though this passage is often subtitled A Woman Caught in Adultery or something along those lines, I've kind of retitled it Jesus Tested by the Pharisees because even though the woman caught in adultery is a secondary narrative in this, she's not the key point here. It's not really her being brought to be put on trial. They're using her as a pawn to try to put Jesus on trial to try to find evidence against him. So verse 2, we have, Now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him and sat down and taught them. And he sat down and taught them. So here the setting is, he's come back to the temple, he's teaching in the temple in a very public location, there's all these people that have come to him. It's also interesting that the the wording, all the people show up here, in that when there is a potential trial in Jewish culture of capital offense at that time period, or going back to Moses' time, see if I have that verse in here, there we go. From Deuteronomy 17.7, we have that how it was supposed to be carried out is that when there was an offense, a potential capital offense, which would have been potentially murder, adultery, idolatry, the hands of all the witnesses shall be first against him to put him to death, and afterward the hands of all the people. So you shall put away the evil from among you. It's kind of interesting that towards the beginning of this passage, we have this reference to all of the people being gathered around Jesus. It's kind of what is about to happen. And so then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. So in case it wasn't clear here, this section of the Pharisees and the scribes bringing an adulterous woman, bringing her in the midst of all the people at Jesus' feet, that this isn't about the woman, is made very clear here in the insertion by the narrator John This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. Their focus is really not on justice with the woman caught in adultery. Their focus is on setting Jesus up in front of 
all of the people. This is one of the only times in the Gospel of John where the scribes are specifically mentioned. Generally, when the ruling individuals of the Sanhedrin and the Jews are mentioned in the Gospel of John, they're mentioned either as the Jews, and in context it's understood to mean not all of the Jews, but rather just the ruling class, or as the Pharisees. Um, this is one of kind of the textual criticisms that individuals say, well, John never uses the phrase scribes and Pharisees, so that's more like what Luke would say. Um, but just because this is the only place he chose to use those words doesn't necessarily mean that they weren't the words he chose to use. And here it would be really appropriate that the scribes are specifically mentioned because this is the only spot where it is a point of Mosaic law that Jesus is being challenged on as opposed to Pharisaic law in the Gospel of John. And at that time, the scribes weren't just those who wrote and copied the scripture, which would include the law, but they were also seen as playing the role of a lawyer, as an ethicist, or an authority in religious law specifically. And so if there was going to be a trial, if there was going to be a challenge that was a legal challenge, You'd want to have the scribes there also to give authority and authentication to this proceeding as opposed to just the Pharisees. And so it's entirely possible that the inclusion of the scribes and Pharisees here as being the only time in the Gospel of John wasn't because John didn't write it. It was because there was a specific reason why they were players who need to be called out because this was emphasizing this was a legal proceeding, essentially. It's one that on the surface, the scribes and Pharisees wanted to make it look like there's an adulterous woman who's being put on trial. What they're really trying to do is gather evidence to put Jesus on trial, which fits in with Nic what Nicodemus told them to do a few verses before. And she has sat, they sat her in the midst. And they say to him, teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Jewish law required that for a capital punishment, there had to be witnesses. There had to be a witness of at least two or three individuals. It's not specifically stated whether they have witnesses or not, but the fact that they add in, in the very act, either means they have witnesses or they want to make it sound like they have witnesses. We don't know which it is, and that's not really that important here. But in Jewish law, it's important that there be at least two or three witnesses. Um, Joan asks the question, where is the man in this? Because if she was caught in the act of adultery, this wasn't a solo sin. Um, we don't know. The, the man is not mentioned here at all. It's possible that he got his running shoes on quicker and was out the door quickly and they didn't catch him. It's possible that because their goal here was trying and testing Jesus, that wasn't important to them. Could even be that he was one of the potential witnesses. Um, it could also be that he had financial gain in this because if a woman had property and was caught in adultery and was killed in adultery, uh, the husband got that. So men were never stoned? No, that wouldn't be true. No. Um, uh, no. Um, so she couldn't say who she was with? So in this case, that's not recorded. So we don't know. So some of this we have to be careful as far as speculating what the passage doesn't say. But for whatever reason, she is brought by herself. Now Jesus doesn't really address that here. And I think partially because that's not what is important here. 
And we're going to see if there's some other details in this passage that are often focused on that, again, are not really that important when it comes right down to it. But, yeah, there is a question as far as why was she brought forward? And certainly from a cultural standpoint, not just in that time period, in this time period also, should be very obvious that often in an in a adulterous relationship, the woman is seen as the, the Jezebel, the harlot, more than the man is. Um, so certainly that could have come into play here as far as inappropriate cultural norms that has a double standard. But we don't know exactly why she was brought by herself other than I think we can infer that again, the focus here should not be her. Certainly she comes into play, but the focus here is the legal challenge between the scribes and the Pharisees and Jesus, the Son of God himself. So here the challenge isn't between a court of law and a woman who's caught in adultery. It's between religious leaders and God himself. And the religious leaders challenging God himself. And likely in this, they were trying to set up a catch-22 gotcha situation. Because as they bring up in, in verse 5, now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what do you say? On the one hand, they're saying, okay, Moses and the law, and within Jewish tradition, the first century, especially among the Pharisees, Moses and the law was the gold standard, so to speak. You bucked against that. That was heresy. That was blasphemy. That was a potentially a capital offense. And so on the one hand, they're saying, but what do you say? Are you going to agree she should be stoned? But keep in mind at that time in the first century, they were also under Roman rule. Even though they had temple police, even though they had certain things that they were allowed to adjudicate on, capital punishment wasn't one of them. That was the realm of the Roman authorities. That's why a little over six months later, when the Jews do bring Jesus on trial, they don't crucify him themselves. They bring him for the Roman authorities because they didn't have at that time period the authority to do capital punishment. And so, because, so on the one hand, they're saying, well, if he says don't stone her, we can then tell the people, all the people, that he's against the Mosaic law and, of course, is evil. On the other hand, if he says go ahead and stone her and is involved with the stoning potentially, now they potentially can turn him into the Roman authorities and say, look, he is overstepping Caesar. So they think they've set up this catch-22 situation, which is why very likely to him just bringing one person was sufficient because they didn't really care which answer he gave. Both of them in their mind would have been an ability to accuse him. And so doing shoddy police work and only bringing one of the suspects was okay because that wasn't the point. It's unlikely they had any intention to stone her. Because even though that was considered a very severe sin and a very severe crime, because of the Roman authority, stoning of somebody caught in adultery at that time was very, very rare. Because they didn't want to run foul with Rome either. And so they're saying this to test him. So we have in the, first, the second part of 6b, 
Jesus' first response. There's kind of a, a multi-part response he has. His first response is to stoop down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. And in the Greek, it's emphasized a little differently in that the word order is that Jesus stoops down and with his finger writes on the ground. And that's going to be important. There's a lot of speculation. I said in this passage, there's a lot of things we can speculate on. What about the man? What about whether this is even supposed to be here and whether it's even supposed to be part of the Gospel of John? Uh, we could also speculate, and many commentators have, on what Jesus wrote. Some even have gone so far as to speculate exact passages from Exodus that Jesus wrote out. Or other things that he wrote, such as the name of the man, such as the, the, the Ten Commandments, such as whatever else. Um, the fact is we don't know what he wrote. That wasn't recorded, and it wasn't recorded because clearly it's not important. Because what's important gets written down. But evidently, the fact that with his finger he wrote on the ground is important. It wasn't just mentioned once in this passage. It's mentioned twice in this passage. So let's continue on to that second time and then talk a little bit about very likely why it is mentioned here. And so when they continued asking him, they're persistent. They don't want him to ignore them. He raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Uh, let's see, I get out of order here. All right, that's where I am. So we have, he gets down to the ground level. With his finger, he writes on the ground. They persist. He then responds verbally, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first, and then he writes on the ground again. Um, in Jewish narrative, uh, we've talked about how there's often parallel structure that's used and how the center is really important. And here we have, in the center of this passage, not once, but twice, Jesus writing on the ground. But it doesn't say what he wrote. What's important here is not what he wrote, but what he was doing. He was teaching by his actions. He was showing all of the people, he was showing the Pharisees, he was showing the woman caught in adultery, he was showing the readers of the text here something. And what he was showing is who the author of the law was. It wasn't Moses. In Deuteronomy 9.10, we have, Then the Lord delivered to me, and this is Moses speaking here, Then the Lord delivered to me two tablets of stone, written with the finger of God. And on them were all the words that the Lord had spoken to you on the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. The Pharisees, the scribes especially, should have known that of the 613 laws in the Mosaic Law, 603 of them were written on, on parchment. Ten of them were originally written on stone by the finger of God. And one of those ten was the law that is being discussed here, thou shalt not commit adultery. They've brought to him and they've told him, now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what do you say? And his response is to write with his finger on the ground. He's showing them the law didn't come from Moses. He's showing them that the law about adultery was written by the finger of God. 
He's been telling them that he and his father are one. He is from above. He is the son of God. He is the creator God. He is the finger that wrote the law. They're asking him, but what do you say? They should already know what he says. He's been telling them. So he switches his teaching tactic here and switches from verbal to visual learning. And by his finger, he's showing he is the author of the law. And so if there's anyone who can rightly discern the law, it would be him because he wrote it. Now when he goes on and says, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. This is a verse that is often pulled out of context and especially by those who wanted to throw it in the face of a Christian who's maybe coming across as being too judgmental and say, oh, you know, he's without sin among you. Let him throw a stone at first. This is not saying he is without a sin who is sinless. Because if Jesus was saying he is without sin among you, if by saying that he was saying those of you who are sinless, pick up the stone and stone her, would basically be negating the Mosaic law. And clearly in the context here of the entire Gospel of John, Jesus didn't come to negate the Mosaic law. He came to fulfill the Mosaic law and to save us from our sins and our breaches of the Mosaic law and of law in general. Because if he was saying, you must be sinless to carry out the judgment of the law, he'd be negating the law and saying that the Mosaic law is rubbish. But he just demonstrated by writing on the ground with his finger that he wrote the law. He's the author of the law. He would not go on to say that this law is rubbish. Instead, this is tied to the verses we already looked at, which I thought I put in here a second time, but I guess I did not. Let me go back to it. There we go. Is in the law and a capital punishment, how it would be carried out is the witnesses will be the first and then all of the people. So to carry out the law properly, it wasn't just a matter of putting her to death. It was a matter of the witnesses as proof of the authenticity of what they were saying. They were the first to throw the stones. And if their witness was later found to be false, because they had thrown the stones first under false witness that they had done, that then would be murder. And so it was very serious to be a witness because if you were found to be false, you couldn't just say, ah, well, I didn't kill them because, yeah, they did. And then all the people would show an agreement that this isn't an individual stoning. This is a justice being carried out by all of the people would then follow in suit. So first, the the witnesses, to do it correctly, had to be true witnesses. It also meant that in Jewish tradition, the witnesses could not be individuals who are partakers of that specific sin. There was no plea bargain type of setup where you caught, going back to the man and woman, you caught the man and woman or there was suspicion of it, and the man gets to be the witness against the woman, and he gets a plea deal that he doesn't get stoned, he gets off with a slap on his wrist type of thing, because he now witnesses against the woman. That wasn't allowed. Because for a witness to be able to testify, the witness could not have been involved with that sin. There was no plea bargaining of a group of people and saying, well, you know, separating them out into separate questioning rooms and say, oh, are you going to turn? We'll give you a deal if you turn on the other four type of thing. In the matter of a capital offense in Jewish tradition, that wasn't allowed. An individual who was a witness could not have been part of the sin, so to speak. 
and built around that, as the Pharisees like to do, is build kind of hedges around things, was built also kind of the implication that an individual who had, was guilty of that particular sin, maybe not that particular instance, but that particular sin would not be considered a reliable witness. And so in this context here, Jesus is not saying he who is sinless among you, let him throw a stone at first. He is saying that of who first and foremost is the witness who is not guilty of adultery, let him throw the stone first. And keep in mind, for all the people then to follow in, it had to be started by a witness, so to speak. It had to be somebody who witnessed it. And he again writes on the ground with his finger. Then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Which is kind of an interesting phrasing here. It's partially to put it in parallel with, with verse 3, where the Pharisees bring her in and set her in the midst. Kind of makes sense then, because Jesus is teaching a large crowd of all the people, and she's set in the midst. Well, now, everybody has left, and she's still in the midst. Well, that's because Jesus is no ordinary man. He is the son of God. He is one with God the Father. She is in the midst of God's judgment. She is in the midst of God's Shekinah glory. And she's left alone there. Now, we don't know specifically why each individual left. Some of them may have left because they were witnesses. And when they realized that a witness wasn't going to step forward, they recognized for them to pick up a stone and to stone would be against Mosaic law because Mosaic law said there had to be two or three witnesses who had to be reliable witnesses and the first stones were thrown by them. And so they may have been convicted from the standpoint of, oh, maybe this isn't an appropriate trial here. I need to recuse myself and leave. It could be that the witnesses who were ready to testify were convicted because they recognized that this was not a specific sin that they were innocent of themselves. And this may come into play where some of the men there may not have been brought up on adultery charges, but now are being brought up on adultery charges because they're recognizing the individual who just told them he was without this specific sin among you, would probably be a better reading of this, let him throw a stone at her first, who's just been writing on the ground. They're connecting the dots and recognizing this is not a situation they want to be in. The other possibility also is they may have been convicted because they just realized, wait a minute, Jesus has just basically said, yes, she's guilty of adultery. Yes, by Mosaic law, she should be stoned. But if you're going to stone her, you need to do it correctly by Mosaic law. And they realize they're doing this all wrong because, one, they only brought the woman. They didn't bring the man. Secondly, they had no intention of this being a stoning of an adulterous woman. This was an intention to catch Jesus, and they're convicted because they realize they haven't and if they continue with this charade, they now are running afoul of Roman authorities potentially for having killed somebody, and Jesus walks away not having been caught by this. So they now realize they are in a complete catch-22 situation where there is nothing they can do except silently walk away. Which we've seen that as kind of a theme. That from John 1, 4, and 5, in the introduction, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. 
and how that word in the Greek for comprehend can be translated two different ways. It can be either comprehend, as in they didn't understand it, or overcome. So the darkness doesn't comprehend the light, and the darkness does not overcome the light. So here we have these individuals who came in darkness of their hearts to judge Jesus and have now been exposed by the light and are silenced. And in this case, they don't completely understand it. They don't accept it, but they don't conquer it, and they walk away. And it's kind of appropriate that this be kind of a picture of that because the next section we won't make to today, but the next section is the next I am statement where Jesus proclaims in verse 12, I am the light of the world who has just exposed the plot that these scribes and Pharisees have tried to bring evidence against him, against the Mosaic law. And the woman is left alone. And she's really only left alone with the one who is the only one in that group who truly met the qualification of being without sin and being able by the Mosaic law to throw the first stone. It's interesting also that after saying he is without sin, he stoops down and writes on the ground again. So here, when he's left alone with the woman, he is down at her level, at ground level, emphasizing, again from the prologue in verse 114, that the word became flesh. The word came from above and came down to our level where we are in our sin. Not that he became sinful, but he came down to our level. And so in verse 10, Jesus raised himself up and said, and saw no one but the woman. He said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And so often in conversations with individuals, Jesus will start with questions, not because he needs the answers, because it's something for them to think about. And she's alone there, not because she's innocent, but because the others have left when they were convicted. She isn't innocent here, which is very clear from the last words that Jesus says to her in verse 11. He doesn't ask her if she's guilty. He doesn't ask her that. And so she replies, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. He's not telling her she wasn't caught in adultery. He isn't telling her she isn't sinful. He's saying, yeah, you are. But, but he was not going to condemn her but he was going to challenge her and command her to go and live a changed life and to not sin. And this is very much an example of a passage we've seen before when, interestingly, Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, and Nicodemus is one of the Jewish rulers who presumably, unless he recused him from this incident, was one of the individuals who helped set this incident up. John 3, 16, for God so loves the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And he's showing that here to this woman, that he came to all of the world because God loved the world. And here, this statement, God loved the world, since it's a common verse that we all know, we often don't realize of when John wrote the Gospel of John, what, an intent, what a potential bombshell that would have been, because the picture of the world is the world being in sin and in darkness and being an adversary for God. And yet here it says, God loved that world. God loved this woman who was caught in adultery. God loved all of those individuals who came to convict him. He didn't come to condemn them. He came to save them. And some of them rejected him. This is a statement from 
uh, Edward Klink's commentary on the Gospel of John that he kind of closed this section on. I think that was really good, so I just want to read it word for word. The concluding exhortation of Jesus to the woman accused of adultery is a command to sin no longer. It is a gracious command to live life in freedom. The gospel of Jesus Christ proclaims a remarkable paradox. The author of the law of God and the judge of humanity is also the one who receives the punishment. The giver of life embraces death for us. The one without sin becomes sin for us. This is grace and love. This is good news. For this reason, the Christian strives to embrace the law, the law of Christ in every way. To do this is to submit to sin no longer and instead to submit to Christ. Let's close in prayer. Oh, sorry, Connie. Yes. Yep. And, and actually, while you're talking, there's something that, that kind of struck me um, to really emphasize here is with that, it was to the, the stoning, put the evil out of your midst. The final words Jesus has to this woman is go and sin no more. He's basically telling you, go and do not do evil. He is putting the evil out in a different way in terms of a way that only he can do in terms of forgiving this, but not just forgiving. And this is actually one of the things that was brought up and why this passage was seen as being potentially offensive to some of the early church, because some of them saw it as an excuse that an individual could use to commit adultery to basically say, well, look, Jesus forgave her, so it's open season, so to speak. And they're completely missing that he isn't saying he's found her without fault, nor is he giving her a blank sheet. He's saying, go and sin no more. He's challenging her to live a life that is a changed life, that is a different life. Yes. Yes. Um, so, yeah. Um, actually, Doug, could I ask you to close in prayer?